I'm like on the hook, right? For this guy. It's like I brought it up to, uh, to help him. Uh, my name is Randall Parks. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps in 2001 and retired in 2021. Retired as a first sergeant. Uh, when I came in, I was an infantryman uh, and then I was a parachute rigger for a time and then retired as a first sergeant. Well, first and foremost, Josh, dude, it's great to see you again. You too, and, brother. Uh, thanks for having me be back. Uh, back by popular demand, I guess. Um, so I, uh, I kind of grew up all over the place. Um, I, I, uh, I was born in, here in California, uh, specifically Hemet, California, which, uh, like my last video, uh, it's a cradle of fucking civilization out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I moved all over the place, uh, all the way down the coast and here in California. Uh, I lived in Texas for a time. And then um, I ended up uh, graduating high school out of Paris High School in Riverside. Um, and then I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. I remember being like, I was maybe like five years old. And I went to my uh, great grandmother's funeral and my uncle showed up and he was wearing like dress blues. And I saw that dude and I'm like, man. What is that? Like, who's that guy? And I asked my dad, and my dad had just gotten out of the Navy. And I was like, yeah, dad, what, you know, what is that guy? He's like, oh, he's a Marine. I was like, man, that, that guy looks freaking cool. I was like, I want to do that. And he's like, no. He's like, don't you ever say that again. And he said, you're never going to join the Marine Corps. <laughs> oh, like, I'm like, what? why? You know, I didn't know there was like a rivalry. I'm five years old. You know, I didn't know there was a rivalry between the services, you know. He's like, yeah, all they do is they go on ship and they, they just eat and sleep and lift weights all day. And I'm like, man, that, that doesn't sound too bad. I think that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so that was like my first like introduction to what I'm to, to seeing a marine. I'd never seen a marine before. Um, and then you know, as I as I um, you know went to high school and everything, I, I played sports. I was a swimmer and water polo player in high school, and, and I did ROTC in high school and. I kind of always knew that I wanted to join the military, but I really was like interested in the Marine Corps. And, you know, I think I just grew up, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, like Ronald Reagan was president, like, like America was number one, you know, and all the movies, all the, all your influences, right? Like growing up all reflected that, you know, like there was Rambo and freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, so like, I just love those dudes. They were like men of action and adventure. And that's what I wanted to do. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, just to give people context, obviously this is your second time here. Yeah. Um, we're gonna kind of fill in some gaps, share some stories that you didn't share the first go. But yeah, so just talk to me about, uh, I know there was a deployment or, or, or two that you didn't discuss in the first one. Um, but yeah, just talk about, you know, just, just give me a rundown of, of your service, you know, what unit that you started off with and how things kind of evolved. Yeah. So, uh, when I first came in, um, I, I signed up for security forces. I was a security forces contract and it's because the recruiter, like he made it sound like it was like SEAL team six or something. And he's like, yeah, man, you're going to be fast roping and, you know, jumping out of planes and stuff. And I was like, oh man, that sounds amazing. So I, I did that. So I uh, went through SOI after boot camp. Um, I, was in, I became an 0351. And then I eventually made it my way to Bangor, Washington. And you know, it was, it was pretty good. I, I got a lot of opportunities there. I, I went to McQuiss, uh, the Marine uh, Corps Instructor Water Survival Course as a corporal. Um, I went to CQB School, uh, Close Quarters Battle School. I went to Breacher School. So I did get to do some cool stuff. Um, and then while I was at McQuiss, I met this guy, um, his name is Jason Swore. And um, he kind of convinced me that um, I should come down to Recon Battalion. So I ended up going down to Recon Battalion and I la ended up lap moving uh, to become a parachute rigger. Um, so first Recon was my second duty station. Um, obviously this is 2004 through six, 2006. Uh, so the war was going on um, because of my infantry background. 2006, I got orders to uh, what is now 1st Raider Battalion, but was then uh, Marine Special Operations Battalion, uh, part of Marine Special Operations Command. 
And then in 2011, I got orders to drill instructor duty. And I was there from 2011 to 2014. And then from 14 to 17, I got orders to second recon. I was a paraloft chief and first sergeant up there. And then my last duty station was MCRD San Diego. Um, I, I'd, like, I'd like to tell like a funny story and this is kind of how it feeds into like my personality as a Marine because I think a lot of people saw some of the drill instructor stuff and they kind of perceived me as like this high and tight, you know, oorah, fucking <laughs> knife handed dude. And I'm not really that way. Um, so in 2007, um, I deployed with uh, MSOC Bravo, and it was the first Bravo company to, to go down range. And you know, we, we, went, we all boarded the USS Cleveland in San Diego, and we all thought when we were leaving San Diego that we were going to Iraq. That was the, that was the word on the street. Um, but we get like four days off the coast, and they're like, no, you're, you guys are all going to Afghanistan. Um, so we float all the way across the Pacific, fly from Kuwait uh, into, uh, into Afghanistan, and, and we did the whole deployment. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we were there, I think, four or five months, and the FOB that we were on was kind of like a, a pretty small like FOB. It was just us, um, like I think two ODAs, um, Green, uh, Green Berets uh, teams, and there was a couple other coalition people on the base, but you know, we lived pretty decent there, but we didn't have like all the creature comforts of life, you know, mm -hmm. like a barber or something like that. So, dude, my flow was just large and in charge, man. Like, I hadn't had a haircut in a long time. I think at some point we brought in like a local Afghan and he was he was lining some lining us up a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so we finished. We're about to finish that deployment. We we uh, convoy from Fob Price to Kandahar, and the Mew had just landed in Kandahar, so they were all set up there, and everything. And, and Kandahar is a pretty decent sized base, coalition base. And so I didn't have anything, man. Like I had my like go bag, and whatever I had in my vehicle, and everything else was in like a jingle truck on the way up there. So I didn't I didn't have very many toiletries. I had a haircut in like like dude, like two months, two, three months, I don't know. So first order of business, man, we get there and I beeline it to the PX. Go get get all my little lickies and chewies and some freaking deodorant, some hair gel, and just like the basic things, you know, that we just didn't have down there. And uh, so I go in there and I get my things and I'm walking out and I got like my bags of stuff. I'm all happy, happy as shit, you know, if I hit the land of the big PX. And the PX has this like Hesco's going down the side. So you're kind of, it's, it's kind of like a hallway, you know? And I am wearing, I've got no cover, no hat, sunglasses. My hair is just freaking everywhere. I have a gray, like a peak kit top. I had de uh, Marine Corps Desert Digital Bottoms. I had civilian hiking boots and my weapon was painted. And I see this dude round the corner, like all sharp, you know? And he's like, <laughs> and he's, dude, he's got the freaking starched out cover. You know, his, his camis are all, I can see the, the lines in his camis. He's got the, you know, the Fobbit Miami Vice holster, you know? <laughs> And he sees me and I could just see the inside of his head exploding. So I'm walking, you know, I got my bag and my weapon. And he's like, stop. And I'm like, I'm like what's, what, what's going on, Gunny? He's like, it's Gunnery Sergeant. I'm like, oh, here we go. And I was a sergeant at the time. And uh, he's like, where is your cover? Wh where is your blouse? Where are your authorized boots? I don't even want to know the last time you had a haircut. And I was like, to be honest with you, Gunny, I, I don't really know the last time I had a haircut either. He's like, it's Gunnery Sergeant. I'm like, okay, Gunnery Sergeant, I, I, I don't remember. And I was like, look, uh, Gunnery Sergeant, like if, if I'm this jacked up, like obviously like somebody has authorized me to be this way. He's like, oh yeah, I want to meet this person. I'm like, okay. So the SODIF compound is right across the, 
uh, across the street. And in order to get into that compound, you have to have a badge. And I knew the gunnery sergeant, he didn't have a badge. <laughs> so, and I'm thinking in my head, like, I'm about to take this guy to Gunny Crawdad at the time and Captain Seely. Like, they're going to murder this dude <laughs> if he comes in there with that bullshit. And, you know, because, like, it's funny because, like, from his perspective, like, he just came off a ship. He's landed here in the land of the big PX. Meanwhile, he has no clue that there's actually a fucking war going on out there. And, I, you know, I'm just trying to get my stuff so I can get cleaned up and go get a haircut and, and get right, you know, in his mind. Mm -hmm. So all this is, like, going through my mind as I'm walking towards the gate. And there's the army specialist at the gate. And he looks at me and I show him my badge. He's like, oh, yeah, you're good. And then I, I sped up a little bit to be a couple, head, uh, a couple steps ahead of the gunnery sergeant. And uh, he's and he, like, he's like, hey, man, uh, where's your badge? He's like, oh, I'm with him. I'm like, hey, man, I, I don't know this dude. <laughs> and I keep walking, and he's like, hey, get back here. Get back here. I'm like, have a good day, gunny. <laughs> <laughs> so I get back, and I tell Crawdad what, uh, what had happened. And Crawdad is this, like, Viking character, right? He's got long, blonde hair. He's, he's like, 6'2", like, 240, just jacked out of his mind. He's got Viking tattoos all up and down his arms. He's like, why didn't you let him in? And I'm like, come on. Go on, Gunny. Like, you would have murdered that dude. He's like, hell yeah. <laughs> so, you know... I just tell that story because, you know, that, that's kind of like who I was as, like a, as a young Marine, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, like, we're engaged while I'm on that deployment that I was just talking about. And then I get back, we get married. I almost didn't, I almost was late getting back because we kept getting extended. And she told me, she was like, you better get back or I'm marrying somebody else. And I'm getting married on this day. And I'm like, don't worry, baby, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> so I get back, um, and then uh, I'm going to all these schools, and, uh, and then we get word that the 1st Marine SODIF is going to go downrange, uh, the Special Operations Task Force. So the Marines have never sent a, a Special Operations Task Force downrange, and I, I get tapped for that deployment. Um, so we start doing some of our workups and everything, and... and uh, you know, right around that time, I found out my wife was pregnant with my son, Brody. And uh, so the command was actually really cool, man. They, they let me stay behind until he was born. So the battalion left, and then, I, and then Brody was born right around the time the battalion left. So I was able to be there for the birth, and then they let me stay back for like 30 days. Um, nice. and, and kind of be with my wife and everything, and, and my, my, my new son. And then, uh, yeah, so um, me and this dude, Greg, we get on a... Uh, C-17, and we were the last pallet ride to Afghanistan. So I get to Afghanistan, and um, um, I ended up staying up in Bagram for a, for a while. Um, and this was kind of a weird deployment because you know, I really didn't experience a whole lot of combat this deployment, maybe a couple times. But I was kind of doing like my job as a parachute rigger during this deployment. Um, so for the first couple months, you know, we would... Um, we would get tasked to go out on these like civilian casas, load up equipment. And I think they used the casas because they could get down super low and we would throw out resupplies to these like random, like small CIA outposts or like, like um, SF teams. So we're like flying in this unarmed casa, me and another Marine and the two like, I think they were like Black Hawk pilots, or oh, not Blackwater pilots. And like, we're like taking off and it hits me. I'm like, oh shit, like if we get shot down, like we're fucked. Like I got a radio and a standard loadout and me and my buddy, you know, we've got Stoner, uh, my buddy Stoner, we both have weapons, but that's it. Like, so it was a super sketch. Wow. And we're flying over. We let out this um, palletized like oil drum. And it almost like kills this freaking Afghani. He like jumps out of the way before it hits. 
And uh, so we, I, we did a couple of those. And then I got word that, um, that I was going to be heading back, um, back to the Sodif at Herat, um, where they were. So I ended up going there and being like the company gunny slash camp commandant. And uh, so I was in charge of like the camp, like the infrastructure of the camp and coordinating with the ANA that was helping guard the, the place. And then I was in charge of all the workers that came on and off the base. And that's where I met my interpreter, Maruf. And uh, Maruf spoke pretty, pretty good English. And um, he was kind of my conduit between, you know, um, what, uh, what the command needed out of all of those guys and, and the Afghan workers. Um, so man, uh, I don't know who was in charge of them before, but I think he, they kind of treated them like crap. So when I came on board, like all of a sudden things, more things started getting done around the camp just cause I treated these guys like with respect. Um, cause they're, you know, they're, they're essentially risking their lives to come on our base and, and do things for us. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pick that up, I guess, later on in the segment, um, how that kind of ties in um, with the last story I'll tell. Um, yeah, so I ended up coming home from that deployment and uh, I ended up getting orders to drill instructor duty. <laughs> now, the plan was that I wanted to go on MSG duty, um, but my wife and I, before I went on that deployment, we had just bought a house in Temecula. So I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll just, I'll submit a package. I'll go drill instructor duty. I had a couple buddies that were down there in San Diego. And I was like, yeah, I guess I'll just go do that. So I submitted my package and then lo and behold, I get orders to Paris Island, South Carolina. Uh. So in January of 2011, um, I check in uh, to drill instructor school at Paris Island, uh, South Carolina. And I'd never been to South Carolina before. Um, and it was, it was kind of cold during that time, time frame, but it was a, kind of a huge culture shock because most of my career had been spent from 2002, essentially, to 2011 had been on the West Coast. So it was kind of a huge culture shock um, checking in there. And, you know, going to drill instructor school is like going back to boot camp. Like, you're running around, you're scre instead of screaming, aye, aye, sir, you're, you're screaming, aye, aye, staff sergeant or gunnery sergeant or whoever. And it's very like strict and pointed because um, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to assimilate you back into that environment because it is a different environment. It's not like the fleet. Um, so of course I had to shave my head before I, before I went. I, I lost all my luscious locks that I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man, DI school is really tough. Um, it, it, it's mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually strong. And, and one way or the other, they're going to get you in yeah. one avenue or another. But I had a really great roommate, uh, Zane Mormon, a uh, solid dude, meritoriously promoted most of the ranks that he'd, and he, he'd been only been in like seven years, combat vet. Um, he was like, you know, like five foot five, you know, but he was like chiseled, jacked. Um, and uh, we did, we, you know, we did everything together throughout that, that course. Um, what was the most challenging part of that school? For me personally, it was assimilating back into that environment. Because for the last, you know, quite a few years, I was with Recon Battalion or Marine Special Operations Command. And the culture and the vibe of that place is different than on the depot. Um, now there are some parallels like in, you know, physical fitness and, you know, trying to, you know, doing the best that you possibly can, um, trying to be number one in everything, those things kind of parallel, but that was probably the biggest challenge for me was to assimilate to that environment. Cause I was pretty senior. Like I, I'd been in the Marine Corps, um, 10, 11 years by that point, whereas most of the people in the class had been in five or six. So I was far removed from that initial, you know, recruit training environment. As hard as it was, it was really actually a very professionally ran school. Like they, they adhered to standards, they held you accountable, and you were expected to perform at your, at your highest level. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was a good experience. And I was lucky to have my roommate, um, Zane Mormon, with me because he, 
him and I, we, we prepped everything together. We studied together. We, you know, we prepared for the next week together. Like, and so it was no surprise by the end of the, the course that he finished first in the class and I finished second. Nice. Um, cause we pushed each other and we, you know, we just did it as a team. Um, so yeah, I, I really credit him a lot with, uh, me being successful uh, in that. Do you course. get any um, benefits from finishing top in the class? Um, I think I got to pick which battalion I went to. Mm. And then um, when I checked in to second battalion, second recruit training battalion, we had this sergeant major, I, don't, I can't remember his name now, but he had a really like thick, like Boston accent. And he comes in, he's like, you know, welcome to second battalion, you know, and he's like, He's like, where do you want to go? And I wanted to go to a hotel company because that's who I did my observations with. And he's like, fine, done. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I graduate DI school, fly back to California. Kinsley's, or my uh, wife Heather's pregnant with my daughter Kinsley. Um, and we needed to leave her in California for like continuity of care while she was pregnant. So I flew back, all right, I drove cross country back to Paris Island, hastily unpacked all my goods and everything, and then checked in uh, for my first cycle. Wow. Yeah, talk to me about how that first cycle went. Dude, it was weird, man. Like, again, different environment, right? Like, the day I checked in was the day the SEALs killed Osama bin Laden. Oh, wow. Like, so, or it was the next day, right? Like, um... So I meet my team, right? And I'm like shaking, my, shaking their hands and introducing myself. And I'm like, hey, did you guys hear? Like the SEALs, they, they got Bin Laden last night. They killed him. And they were like, oh, yeah, we heard that. So uh, this is how I want to teach uh, Column Wright. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you guys aren't pumped about this? Like, so it was like just like a different like environment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and honestly, I, I had a hard time adjusting to my character. Um, being a drill instructor, being a green belt drill instructor, you know, like I'm a surfer dude from San Diego, you know, it wasn't really like my personality. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like one of the guys on that team, his name is Josh Cook. Uh, he'd always say we're the world's uh, worst paid actors <laughs> <laughs> because you have to play a role. Right. And you know, what people don't understand about recruit training and specifically about the time frame in which I was there from 2011 to 2014, like Afghanistan was full tilt for the Marine Corps, right? Like Sangin was going on, like lots of guys were getting killed in Afghanistan. And I knew that, like, so that was like my whole motivation for being a good drill instructor, which meant that I needed to do things to these kids to get them to transform from being a civilian into laying the foundation um, for them to become a Marine. Because um, I knew within six months of graduation, like a lot of these kids were gonna be in Afghanistan. And for those of you that don't realize, Afghanistan is one of the harshest places on this planet. And they're fighting some of the harshest people on this planet. So, you know, to take them from being a disgusting civilian from whatever upbringing they, they had from every walk of life, right? Every religion, every race, every creed, from what, uh, east of the Mississippi, we get all those kids from New York to Miami to Ohio. Um, so, you know, you, you have to be hard on these kids. You have to train them hard. And that means that you have, to, you have to put yourself through some horrendous abuse. Like, you're on deck in the morning at 3.30 in the morning. And you don't leave to go home until 9 o'clock at night. And, and when you're wearing a green belt and you're, and you're a green belt drill instructor, you were on that whole time. You were blasting kids. You were slaying kids on the quarter deck. You're teaching classes on land nav. You're, you're doing all of these things. But the point, at least in my opinion, your job as a drill instructor is to set the foundation for what these kids hopefully will eventually become. And that is the enemy's worst fucking nightmare. When they leave Paris Island or San Diego, 
all of them, your goal as a drill surgeon, all of them should have a baseline foundation for the, their MOS producing school or the fleet to build on. When they get to the fleet, that is when they will become that warrior, that, that nightmare that keeps our enemies awake at night. I mean, you're not really like simulating combat for them, but you're, you're, you're making them harder as an individual. And how do you make grown men harder? Is by uh, subjecting them to adversity. And the training cycle itself is going to do that. Like most of these kids are sleeping in till nine or 10 o'clock, you know, and now they've got to get up at zero four on Paris Island. Um, but, uh, but really like you're taking these kids from whatever upbringing they came from. And like I said, turning them into that, giving them that foundation. So, and these kids come from all over the place. So I'll, I'll reference one kid in particular. Um, this kid, his name is Respert, Recruit Respert. He was a little older than the average recruit. I think he was like 21, 22. And this is during my first cycle. So I'm, I'm new. And I think he was like old enough to know that I was new. Like he could tell that I was new. And um, one day they're online. And I go up and I'm blasting him for something. I don't remember what it was for, but he looks at me like dead in my face. And he goes, he's like, get away from me, sir. You can't break me. I'm a soldier. What? And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like thinking like this motherfucker, like who the fuck? Like, so that's, this is when I started changing like my mentality into being that like drill instructor. Right. And I look at him dead in his freaking face. And I was like, challenge accepted. So from that point on for like the next, I don't know, five to six days, every morning when he woke up, I'd have the fire watch, bring his go fasters and put them online. Those of you that aren't Marine go fasters like running shoes. And I had him put them online. So as soon as he got up and counted off, he would look down and see him. And I'm like, yep, get them on, get outside. And I would take him to the freaking pit. And on Paris Island, they have pits where you do incentive training, uh, IT. And uh, it's just, a, it's just a, a, a big pit of sand outlined by like telephone poles or, uh, or sometimes they have like uh, railroad ties or whatever. Right. And, and it's thick in there, dude. It's like six inches thick and it's sand fleas and everything. Uh. And yeah, every morning, man, Restford had a date with the pit. And I would just fuck his ass up out there and just slay him uh, until he couldn't fucking move anymore. And then I'd drag him back in. And then the last day I got him, um, I, I took him outside and I was slaying him. And I was having him do like push ups and then mountain climbers, back to push ups, mountain climbers, planks, just killing that core. And after a few minutes, man, Respirate failed, like his body failed. And he just fell face first into the sand. And, uh, and I'm yelling at him to get up and he gets up and I tell him to stand up and start running in place. Um, and before I realized he had his whole face was like covered in fucking sand and he had a trail of tears going down his face. And I went up to him and I was like, yes, yes. I was like, I thought I couldn't break you. Respect, you disgusting thing. And I just like blasted him and he's like, ah! he's like crying. <laughs> and I was like, get inside. So I, once I accomplished my objective, which was to break him, I kicked him inside. Dude, from that point on, Resper was like fucking born again. <laughs> he was like a great recruit. He was always volunteered for shit. You know, I was like, I would be like slaying some kids on the quarter deck and he would come up and just join in. And I'm like, you know, on the outside, I'm like, yes, Raspberry. But on the inside, I'm like, damn, like this kid, this kid's legit. Nice. He was so legit that we almost made him a squad leader wow. towards the end. So here's this kid, Respert, background on him. He's, he was like from Atlanta. He's like some gangbanger kid. I could tell he was like a street kid. Mm. Like he, like he lived on the streets. He was real street smart, very common sense. Um, but he was, he was hard. Um, and, uh, but he needed to get broken. Um, and I don't ever know what happened to him nowadays, but 
Hopefully if he sees this, he'll reach out to me. Yeah, dude, that'd be um, cool, right? I did three cycles as a green belt drill instructor. And like that story really resonates with me because I had kids like that in every cycle that were from like a harsh part of the country that, that wanted to change their life. And they, they wanted to be something better. Um, they wanted to progress. And that is what I was there to do. Um, whether they liked it or not, they were going to give me that discipline or I was going to take it. Right. Um, so by the time I got to my third cycle, I was pretty seasoned. Like I, I knew what made a recruit freaking tick. I knew which ones I needed to spend more attention with and which ones that I could just, you know, they, they got it, right? Like they, they didn't need as much attention. And I would never like give undue attention to kids that didn't deserve it. Um, you know, like if a kid was like overweight and he needed to lose some weight, I'd, you know, help him out with that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I had this idea of like, well, I'll, I'll, I want everyone in the platoon to have the same experience. I want them to all get like what they came here to get. Right. So I printed off a roster of the platoon and I stuck it on my, on the inside of my wall locker. And every day I would just pick a different recruit and that recruit would just have the worst day of their freaking life. From the moment they wake up, I am just in their ear like a freaking gnat. And I just, you know, they come out of the classroom to the pit. And I'd slay the crap out of them all day long. You know, they say you, you have to have a reason to IT them. I'd find a reason. Like, they're a recruit. There's a reason, <laughs> you know? So I did this throughout the whole cycle. And at the end of the, of the cycle, like usually the night before graduation, um, we have all the recruits come on the quarter deck. We set up like four foot lockers and the drills that are sit down on the foot locker like I am now. And we do what's called a gong show. And it's like a time for the recruits to tell funny stories about the cycle. And they, maybe they'll act out like a skit of something that happened throughout the cycle. Um, because you're bonded with these kids. Like, and don't listen to all these like drill instructors just say, I don't bond with my recruits. Like, yes, you do, motherfucker. Like these kids will remember your name on their deathbed because of what you did, not just to them, but for them, right? So this kid stands up and he's like, uh, Steph's on Parks, I have a question. I'm like, what do you got, dude? And he's like, uh, he's like, you know, there was, a, there was a day on grass week that you like, you like jacked me up like all day long. And like, I don't feel like I deserve that. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? You were a recruit. You deserved it. He said, well, I, you know, it was, it was all day. I'm like, oh, well, that's because it was your day. And he's like, and as soon as I said that, like the whole platoon looked at me and erupted because they all had their day. Like I would go down and be like, oh, yeah, Smith. And I would like, all right, Smith, it's your turn all day. He didn't know that. And then, you know, it became a thing, you know, I'd come in in the morning and by this time, you know, like I'd been a drill sitter for a minute. So I had this like swagger about me and I'd walk in, throw my uh, wall locker open and be like, Smith. And then, you know, the senior drill sitter would be like, damn it. So they, they weren't able to see this roster. No, no, time. no. The only people that were in on, on, the, on the plan of the day was me and the other drill instructor. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, just super funny. Um, I think they, they will remember that like forever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But so I, I left there. I went to the, um, I went to the pool for my quota cause I was, a, 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 a instructor of water survival and I was there for a year. Um, and then, uh, and then instead of going back to hotel company, I went to golf company because they didn't have a, uh, spot for me as a gunny cause I was a gunny at that point. So I went to golf company. They called it Gunny Golf because that's where they stuffed all the gunnies. Um, so I check in and my first sergeant knew that I came from hotel. Um, and I check in, he's like, hey, I'm going to make you a senior drill instructor. Um, and I was like, well, I haven't been an EDI yet. And EDI is like the kind of the drill instructor that teaches drill. Mm. And he's like, I don't give a shit about that. Like, I need a senior drill instructor that's a gunny and you're it. 
I'm like, oh, okay, um, who's, my, who's my EDI then? Who's the guy that's teaching drill? And he's like, oh, it's this guy, Steph's on Calderon. He's great. He's on his second cycle. And I'm like, second cycle? Like, what you, first arm, like, what are you trying to do, man? Like, because generally, if you're an EDI, you've been there three or four cycles. Mm. So I, 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 my perception was that he didn't have the experience. And then he was like, oh, by the way, I'm going to give you two new uh, drill inserters at a DI school. I was like, oh, man, like, we're done. He's like, just go talk to Staff Sergeant Calderon. He was my EDI. And so I went and talked with him. And I was asking him about, you know, how long he'd been in. He's like, oh, I've been in like 15 years. What was your MOS? He's like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an 0369, an infantry platoon sergeant. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, man, we're going to be good. I was like, hey, dude, this is all I need from you is the EDI. I need you to get the recruits to the right place at the right time with the right gear, just as you would as an infantry platoon sergeant. The drill stuff, hey man, we'll just figure it out. <laughs> um, so throughout the cycle, man, like we're like, you know, reviewing the drill manual on the parade deck and all the other drill centers laughing at us and shit. And, uh, but did, we did good, man. Yeah. Like the initial drill, I think we finished second or third. Nice. And then for final drill, we won. Wow, really? We won because, in truth, we told Calder and I didn't really like drill, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a requirement, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned, like, you're going to have to do things that you don't want to do or you don't necessarily like to do, and you're going to have to invest the time required to do it at a high level. So we would review the drill manual because we were learning out of the drill manual, we were doing it the right way. We were teaching it the right way. And the other drill instructors, they were just teaching it based off of their experience. Whether that was right or wrong, who knows? But Calderon was freaking awesome, man. I love that dude. Yeah. I, still, I still talk to him today. Like I said, we're bringing these kids from every walk of life. Like, and there, there may be a slight psyche valve, but we have no clue, like, about a lot of these kids. You know? So, uh, yeah. So I remember being on quota at the pool. And I was sitting on my porch in the evening, and I lived on base. And I see this, what I thought was a recruit, but could have very well been a Marine in green, a green shirt, green shorts. And he, had, and he was just walking through base housing. I'm looking at him like, man, that looks like a fucking recruit. But, you know, he's by himself. So I'm like, oh, it could be a Marine. And then I notice he's wearing <laughs> recruit go fasters. A Marine is not going to be wearing those freaking go fasters. <laughs> so I was like, zero. And he's like, stopped. And I'm like, oh, got you, bitch. <laughs> Get over here. And uh, yeah, I called, uh, I had the MPs come and they picked him up, and fucking took him out. But he was just, he was trying to escape. He was oh, trying to leave really? Paris Island. Well, Maybe they don't know this. The recruits don't know this. I, I don't know. But there's only one way on and off Paris Island. There's a, a road, a single road that goes over a bridge. Like, so it's like Alcatraz, dude. Like, it's wow. freaking. Wow. So he was trying to take off. Yeah. It's like, a, I was like, damn, man. What the hell is that kid doing? Wow. So did he get processed out? I don't know. I don't ever know what happened yeah. to him. But yeah. I, I thought that was pretty. I've seen some recruits do some wild stuff. But I thought that was. That was probably the more PG-13 version. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I learned a lot about um, leading others because, you know, when you're a green belt general, that's not, that's not real leadership. Um, you're playing a role. Like, and you're, you have a job to do. Um, but as, like, a senior and a chief drill instructor, like, you really learn a lot about leadership. Because as a senior drill instructor, you're, you're those kids' only outlet. Like, because they're not getting any love from the green belt. <laughs> But as a senior drill instructor, like, you have to care about these kids. They got problems. They got, you know, family members that pass away through, throughout the cycle. They've got, you know, wives that are leaving them. Or they've got kids back home that they need to take care of. And you're that guy that has to take care of them. Um, so, you know, I really appreciated that experience um, before leaving there and going back to the fleet. I think it made me not just the experience of being on that duty, um, made me a better leader, but I think it, it prepared me to put up with um, harsh environments, and it, I think it made me harder.
mm. um, because of what you endure as a drill instructor. So what the recruit endures as in, in recruit training is here, what the drill instructor endures six, nine cycles over and over again, it makes you a different person. Very demanding, huh? Yeah, it's wild. And it's not like you get overtime pay. Oh, yeah, you get uh, $395 a month or something like that in oh. like drill instructor pay. Oh, you do? You get drill instructor pay. Yeah. yeah. So after, after that, I got orders to uh, 2nd Recon Battalion, and I took over as the Paraloft Chief there, um, which was a great gig. Um, while I was there, um, we, we did a lot of training. We were doing a lot of high altitude jumps. Um, I got to go to the, the tandem course where you, you hook on another person to you and jump out of a plane. Um, the barrel course where you're jumping out with like a 330 pound barrel attached to you as you're free falling through the sky. Um, uh, I really got to hone in my skills as a free fall jump master because I ran a lot of the high altitude jump packages and everything. And it, it was a really great experience. I met just the most phenomenal people at that unit that I still uh, keep in touch with today. Um, yeah, man, it, it was it was a really like great experience and I, and I really appreciated being there. So I went to this course out in Arizona. It was like a advanced um, high altitude free fall course where you were, you were jumping more advanced profiles, right? Like, so you're jumping on unmarked zones at night. Uh, you're jumping with night vision because at the time guys weren't really wearing night vision goggles, um, while they were jumping. Um, we had tablets where we were navigating and planning the operation on. So it was like towards the end, um, we're, we're jumping out at like 13,000 feet. We have oxygen, full kit, everything, um, plate carrier, weapon, uh, ruck. And I was the first one out because I was usually the heaviest. So you jump out and the profile was that we were going to jump out and deploy within a thousand feet. Um, so I jump out and, and it was, you know, it's Arizona out there where we were jumping. So my face is just super sweaty. Um, I didn't even bother wearing goggles. So, uh, cause you know, we were jumping out and pulling right away. Uh, so I got my oxygen mask on. I jump out as soon as I hit the relative wind, my oxygen mask shoots up into my fucking eyeballs and I can't see anything. So I'm like falling. I have no point of reference cause I can't see which way is up or down. So I'm like reach over, I counter with this hand. I'm like trying to counter with my feet and my elbow push my oxygen mask down. I'm like checking my altimeter. I'm way below pole altitude where I was supposed to pull. I'm like, damn it. So I, you know, go to um, release. So, you know, and as I do this, I'm starting to spin, you know, all over the place. And I, I let it up. And then as soon as it opens, you know, I finally get the stupid oxygen mask out of my face. I'm looking up and it's like barely opening and it's like struggling to open. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> and I've never really had a, like an incident before, but I was like, oh dude, I'm about to cut this bitch away. And I'm like looking at my altitude, looking at it. I'm like, okay, it's still progressing. It's still progressing. <laughs> Eventually it opened and then we all landed. We landed a little bit short from where we were trying to land. Uh, cause I, cause they had to catch down to me cause I bled so much altitude. Wow. But yeah, it was wild. That's scary, man. <laughs> wow. So yeah, after that, um, uh, after I did that deployment um, on the 2-4 MU with the, the Maritime Raid Force, um, while I was on deployment, I was in Africa and I found out I got orders to the depot. So I went to the depot, did my you know, three years there, decided to retire, uh, all that's like on the other, on the, uh, other segment. So, I retired in October of 2021. So back up to about January of 2021. January 2021, I start getting contacted on Facebook by my old interpreter um, from my third deployment. And he's like, sir, sir, you know, I just want to connect with you. You know, how, how are you doing? How's your family? Just making small talk. And then eventually he hits me with it and he's like, hey, you know, Afghanistan is, is deteriorating like quickly. Like, can you help me and my family get out? 
you know, I'm a first sergeant on the recruit depot. Like, I'm like, man, what, what can I do? And he sends me a template. He's like, hey, you can write a letter for me and send it to the State Department. The State Department has an SIV program, um, Special Immigrant Visa Program. I was like, I mean, dude, it takes 10 minutes out of my day, dude. So, of course, I print it or, or type it up, print it out, sign it, scan it, send it back. I don't hear anything from him for, for like a month. And then out of nowhere, I get a, a photo of him. Um, he was making his way onto the base and he got ambushed. And he was like full of holes, like, like he got stitched up. Um, and he was in the hospital and eventually he made it out of the hospital. And this is probably, man, May, June time frame. And he's like, hey, you know, they're looking for me, they're, they're, my family's in danger, what can I do? I'm like, dude, I know it's a trek from Herat to Kabul, but you need to make it to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Just go there. So this is like June, right? Like the American public have no idea what's happening. Um, so I start like looking into it, like researching, like what is going on in Afghanistan? Because even me, I was kind of detached, you know? And I can see that like province after province is falling one after the other. After the new president got sworn in, it was just a steady stream of provinces falling. And then I see, you know, a news alert that we gave up, you know, Kandahar, we gave up Bagram, and he's making his way to Kabul. So at this point, this is June, July time frame. I'm engaging with, I'm not getting anything from the State Department. I'm engaging with Congressman Darrell Issa's office, um, they have a military like attache or liaison to the, to the congressman. I'm talking with them and they were phenomenal. Like they were reaching out to the state department. They were actually getting responses back, but it's a mess over there, right? Like you're looking for a needle in a sea of needles. Like it's crazy. So then um, he finally makes it to Kabul. And by then I'm, I've been engaging with Congressman Darrell Issa's office for a couple weeks but nothing is like happening. Nothing is moving. Um, and then one day I turn on the news and I see that famous video of the Marines running into the Kabul airport, like machine guns and everything. And I, for a second, I was like, hell yeah. But then a second, I was like, oh shit, like Maroof is there. Like, and then I start seeing everything unfolding. The country is collapsing on Kabul. So there was a guy that I went to USC with um, a special forces guy, and I start reaching out to him. And him and uh, another group of individuals are already working the problem. Like, they've, they've been working it for, for a week or two. And I reach out to my cousin Eric. He's a special forces guy. He's tied in with some, some uh, signal chat group. And there's, there, so I realized there's this whole, like, underground of things going on. So Eric, I tie in with Eric and his group and we get Maroof to a safe house and we keep him. And this is all going on over my cell phone. Um, I go into my office in my house and I kind of set up like a makeshift like COC. And I'm like tracking him. Like he's sending me pin drops of where he's at. We're moving him to, from safe house to safe house all over Facebook Messenger and this Signal app. And we're trying to get him to Abbey Gate because that's where everyone was coming in. And I didn't realize, but Abbey Gate was just a madhouse. Thousands and thousands of Afghans trying to get out through that gate once they secured the airport. Um, as he's making his way to the gate, um, he's texting me that they're, uh, they're like beating his kids. The Taliban are beating his kids. And he's telling me they're seeing people pulled off into alleyways and shot. They're executing people. Um, and, you know, I'm like, I'm like on the hook, right? For this guy. Like I've brought it up to, uh, to help him. And uh, so I'm like in overdrive, man. I'm like, fuck. Like, I got to get this dude out. Like, he's depending on him and, and, you know, he's sending him pictures of his wife and kids. And he's depending on me to make it happen. 
And uh, so I'm reaching out to my fucking network. And for all of you that know me, you know I got a pretty good network. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a good dude. So I hit up this guy, Matt Bartles. He's like one of those dudes. He's a lieutenant colonel. He's one of those dudes that knows everybody, right? And I'm like, Matt, dude, you got to help me out. I'm on terminal leave at this point. I'm like, you, you got to help me out. Like, do you know anybody on the ground in Kabul? He's like, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. My buddy that I went to like TBS with or whatever is the battalion commander of an infantry battalion on the deck. I'm like, excellent. Are you in... Do you have comms with him? He's like, yeah, I'm talking to him on signal. You want his number? It was like, easy as that. I was like, fuck. So I started hitting him up. And it was like, you, get, you feel like you're going to get a win, and then you, you hit a roadblock. You feel like you're going to get a hit and win, and then you hit a roadblock. So I hit him up, and he's like, yeah, look, man, I'm not, I'm not rescuing you know, interpreters, but... There's a, there's a seal that's on the ground here. His name was Chris. I think that was his name. Here's his, here's his number. Send him all of their paperwork over signal, and he'll work getting them out. So I sent it over to him. I didn't hear anything for like 24 or 48 hours. You know, I'm watching the news. It's imploding. You know, the, the, the country is imploding. Finally, I get a message. He's like, hey, Randall, sorry for the late reply. As you can imagine, super busy. How can I help? So by this point, I had reached out to a guy at Central Command, another guy that I know. Um, his name's Mo Pal. And uh, Mo Pal's another one of those dudes, big Hawaiian, larger than life type character. And he works, he's like one of the, like the operations chief um, for like their intel cell there. And he's like, hey man, how you doing brother? He's like, yeah, we got guys on the ground. We can help you out. So now, you know, between me, Eric, and Eric, and Matt introducing me to Chris, and now I got, I got Mo Pal. Like, I got, I got a coalition of the willing, son. Like, <laughs> like we're going to freaking, we're going to make this happen. So all of us are coordinating, trying to get this dude. We end, up, we end up moving my interpreter and his family to the north side of the base, and there was like a, uh, like a hidden gate. And now, now that, you know, I've had a chance to talk with Maruf, you know, since then, um, he told me, you know, we, we finally, we moved him from place to place, from um, site to site, and then finally got him to that gate. And he said when they knocked on the gate, like the gate opened and these dudes come rolling out, these big ass dudes come rolling out with nods and it was in the middle of the night, weapons, and they surround him, him and his family. And then they pull him in and they get him into the base into Kabul. So wow. yeah, mission objective, finally got it accomplished, right? So I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm gonna go to sleep. Cause I'm doing all this at nighttime because it's daytime, their time. And then it was like just in the morning, my time. And then it was nighttime, his time when they pulled him in. So I was like, oh man, I'm gonna take a nap. I'm exhausted. And then I get like three missed um, Facebook calls from him. I'm like, fuck, what's going on now? And he's like, oh, sir, sir, uh, there's this Marine. He's trying to escort me off the base. Like, can you talk to him? So I tried calling him back, but I couldn't get through. So I ended up sending like a voice message like, hey, um, this is, uh, you know, this is, you know, First Sergeant Randall Parks. I'm on terminal leave. Like, this guy is my interpreter. Like, we have moved mountains to get this dude to where he's at. Please do not escort him off the base. And this Lance Corporal comes off, comes back on, and he's like, hey, hey, First Sergeant, uh, no worries. I'm gonna get him in a line to get him on the plane. I'm like, oh, fuck, thank God. <laughs> so he sends me a message that he's on the plane and that he's flying out. But as he's flying out, he texts me, picture of three women that are by themselves that are his family members one of whom is his brother's wife who's here in San, who is already here in San Diego hey can you help get them out so I go through this whole like emotional roller coaster all over again so they fly out I'm immediately coordinating with those three women I'm trying to get them 
um, poised to get to Abbey Gate. And right as I do that, the bomb goes off and explodes and kills hundreds of people. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I hope they're not at the gate. Like, I was frantically texting them, like, please text me back. Are you alive? Like, are you good? And then finally, she comes back up on the on comms and she's like, yeah, I'm good. We we decided not to go there because it was crazy and we just Ooh. stayed at the location that you told us to be at. So uh, we fire up what we call the bro call again. So me and Mo Bao, we called it the bro call because that's how this was getting done. You call up your bro and be like, hey bro, like, can you help me out? Like that's how, like the State Department was failing. Our government, the military on the ground were doing the best they could. Um, so it was all happening via bro calls. Wow. So I call up Mo Pal. I, I'm texting that dude Chris on Signal. I'm like, hey, here's the deal. Like lay it out for him. And they're like, they're like, hey, the bomb just went off. Like, give us a minute. Like, just keep him in a safe location. And then eventually, you know, we ended up uh, um, getting a taxi over to him and uh, putting him putting him in that and getting him to the same spot that uh, Maroof and his family. And then they ended up getting. Wow. Whew. So where is he at now? So it took him a few months to get here. Like mm. he went to Germany. He was in Germany for a minute and they flew him to Quantico. He was living in like a tent or whatever in Quantico. And he was like complaining about it. <laughs> I was like, man, fuck you, Maru. I lived in one of those for like seven months. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he eventually made it out to San Diego and he lives... He lives here in San Diego now. Um, he has two jobs. He's a butcher by day and Amazon driver by night. Wow. He's got his driver's license, his green card. His kids are in school. Um, his, uh, his brother was reunited with his wife. So did you meet up with them when he... Got- yeah, I've met up with them a couple times. Um, when they first got here, I did a uh, campaign to raise money um, on GoFundMe. And I raised like 3000 bucks or something like that. So I went down there when he got here and gave him the cash. Um, I collected up a bunch of like clothes and just things because they, they got out of there with a backpack. What was it like seeing him for the first time since, you know, him being here? It was tough, man. It was, it was really tough to see his kids. Um, but I, I, you know, I held it together, you know, and um, um, but yeah, I met up with him a couple weeks, well, maybe a couple months ago now. He'd never been to Mexican food before, so I took him to Las Olas down in Cardiff and got him Mexican food. They loved it. Wow. Um, so, yeah, man. Um, that all was transpiring while I was on terminal leave, so it was essentially it was the last thing that I did as a Marine, um, as an active duty Marine, and uh, it's honestly it's one of the proudest things I've ever done. Wow, that's amazing, man. You saved that whole family. And his, uh, and those other three women. Well, it wasn't me, man. I, I mean, it was. I mean, yeah, you. Co- I mean, yeah. It was Mo Pal. It was. Uh, it was that dude, Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, Eric, Newts, and Eric. And, man, like just wild. That is wild. That is wild. Did, and and he reached out to you, yeah. just out of the blue, huh? Yeah. He he on on uh, on, on Facebook. Facebook. On Facebook. Facebook Messenger. He just went and found you, like yep. like. He, like, for him to think about you, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you must have impacted his life big time while you were over there in Afghanistan with him because yeah. he's like, Randall, yeah. I got to hit up Randall. And then goes on the Facebook and finds you, and that's crazy. Yeah, I guess I, guess I did. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that's amazing, man. That's an amazing story. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, Josh, dude, I, I really appreciate you having me back on and kind of fill some gaps and some stories I didn't have time to tell last time. But, yeah, dude. Um, you know, um, you know what, what I kind of want people to get out of these like stories is to realize like the, the military experience and what it is and what, you know, the, the people that are currently serving or have served, you know, the things that they go through so that you can sleep peacefully in your bed at night. Um, and I guess I'd like to close it out with that, with a quote, um, you know, people sleep peacefully in their bed at night only because rough men stand ready to be, do violence on their behalf.
Mm. And uh, I think there's no truer statement um, that could describe what the military is and what the military does. It's full of rough men that do violence on the American people's behalf. It was a pleasure having you back, brother. Thanks, brother. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear Take me your way cause I don't like here Ghost of my past, they feelin' the night air Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares